begun. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much. And you know what? You bring food. Look at the crowd we get. So thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, we're going to start off first with a roll call. Mr. Town Clerk. Councilman Goldsmith. Here. Councilman Trollinger. Present. Mayor James. Here. Councilwoman Bryant Ward. Present. Councilman Jenkins. Here. All are accounted for. Thank you very much. If you all would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one America, Thank you so much. We have a full yet exciting agenda. I do want to recognize someone in the audience. We have an exchange student, see, I'm going to put you on the spot, who has just been dubbed honorary mayor. Mel is from Germany, and she has uh, to learn about local government. So she's going to think every municipality serves pizza, and uh, we've got a crowd like that. So you go back and you let them know in Germany that's exactly the way it's run in Maryland. So first up on the agenda is the Kalia Award presentation. Chief, do you want to come up? And this is your game right now. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I have an honor to introduce uh, Travis Parrish, the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, Director of Client Services and Relations. Travis was kind enough to travel to La Plata from the Richmond area today, so he could uh, present the Council with LPPD's uh, second accreditation award. So, Travis, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor James, Council members. Mr. Manuel, La Plata residents and guests, I had to get that right. Everybody kept saying, you got to get it right. So I spelled it out, plate, uh, so there we go. <laughs> on behalf of the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, the Commission Chair, Mr. Marcus L. Brown, and the Executive Director, Mr. Craig Hartley, Kalia is honored to be here recognizing Chief Carl Schenner and the, and the La Plata Police Department. To provide a little background, uh, Kalia was created in 1979 uh, when the founding organizations, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Executives, the National Sheriff's Association, and the Police Executive Research Forum recognized a need within the law enforcement community during a period of, in time not unlike what we have experienced over the last several years to develop professional standards to enhance the delivery of police services to citizens throughout the community they serve. Since its inception, Kalia has accredited agencies under standards developed by many of the best public safety practitioners and leaders of our time. The standards are reviewed continuously to ensure each is current and remains relevant. These standards cover a wide range of administrative, operational, and logistical issues and serve as a modern management model that provides the framework for recognizing professional excellence within public safety. In a time when public safety is being scrutinized, La Plata town leaders and citizens should take comfort in the fact that its police department has voluntarily committed to operating at a higher level under a set of rigorous law enforcement standards. The goals of CALEA are to strengthen crime prevention and control, capa and, and control capabilities, formalize essential management procedures, establish fair and non-discriminatory personnel practices, improve service delivery, solidify interagency cooperation and coordination, and increase community and staff confidence in the agency. Based on the goals and mission statement of CALEA, I can think of no better time or place to present this accreditation certificate to the agency than at a public meeting, where all can share and recognize the hard work this agency committed to remain accredited. The certificate itself is simply matted paper within a frame, but it has a much broader symbolic meaning. The certificate clearly represents the agency's efforts to achieve accredited status, thereby demonstrating its willingness to change in order to effectively address contemporary public safety concerns. It represents a commitment to doing the right thing and doing it the right way. Lastly, it represents an ongoing dedication to ensuring the agency's resources are appropriately developed, effectively deployed, and constantly managed, all in the name of a safer community for workers, visitors, and customers. In May of this year, CALEA assessors virtually 
visited, thank, thank you to the COVID, unfortunately, um, visited virtually La Plata Police Department and reviewed the agency's applicable files, activities, functional impacts, and management strategies. At the commission meeting held in Chicago, Illinois, July 23rd, 2022, Calia commissioners reviewed the assessor's report, concurred with their findings, and unanimously voted to approve La Plata Police Department for full Calia accreditation. If it's okay with the council at this time, I'd like to invite the chief executive officer of La Plata Police Department, Chief Carl Schenner, as well as members of his command and accreditation staff that are present to please come forward to receive the Calia accreditation certificate. Having fully demonstrated its voluntary commitment to law enforcement excellence by living up to a body of standards deemed essential to the protection of the life, health, and safety and rights of the citizens it serves, and having exemplified the best professional practices in the, con in the conduct of its responsibilities, hereby, upon the recommendation of the members of the Commission, awarded this Certificate of Accreditation effective on the 28th day of July 2022 and is recognized as an accredited law enforcement agency for a period of four years. And this is the second blue word. Thank you. This is acting up a little bit. We're flashing. I mean, our sorry, mics are flashing. <laughs> this group, I never know what to say. Um, all right. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. And I couldn't be more proud of the, the police department. I know what um, probably just a little bit of all of what Jackie went through. First of all, to try to gather all of the police officers there, that was your first task. But to go through everything, after you all were accredited in, in uh, 2018, it was a matter of making sure everything was done properly. And you guys did an amazing, amazing job. So thank you. Thank you for making La Plata proud and representing us in Chicago. And uh, Jackie, you start again. Four more years, girl. <laughs> That's good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you for coming up from Richmond and presenting this. All right, our next uh, um, on the agenda is the Plata Police Department Architectural Study Presentation, which it looks like we're going to need a bigger uh, police department in order to have all of these uh, wards um, hung up on the wall. So come on down, Chief. Do you want to come down too? And um, we're probably going to need a microphone over there. It's not live, though. All right. She's As part of that uh, CALEA presentation, it would be uh, not very good of me to recognize Ms. DeSoto. Uh, accreditation doesn't come easy. Uh, it doesn't come easy at all. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And the work is really uh, the hard work that our officers do every day. And then Jackie finds it, she places it in the files, and uh, it's the world's greatest paper chase, But uh, as any accreditation process is. But I, I would be remiss not to recognize Ms. DeSoto and her hard work that got us to where we're at and got us to Chicago and the reason why Travis showed up here tonight. So thank you, Jackie. My honor to uh, introduce Mr. Schrader of the Schrader Group. For the past several months, Mr. Schrader and his colleague Harry Petoni. Yes. Harry Petoni. <laughs> Uh, I want to make sure I make people butcher my last name all the time. I don't want to butcher anybody else's. Uh, have worked with our team developing a plan uh, for the future of the Plata Police Department. The plan utilized the uh, organizational study done by PayPoint 
it helped us develop the uh, program plan. Uh, it's important, I think, to know that when I went out asking chiefs and sheriffs throughout the state about the vendors that they use to help them uh, with uh, space needs and construction and architectural services, not all the chiefs reported back that they had a pleasant experience. But uh, the chief in Gaithersburg uh, assured me that by bringing uh, David and Harry in, that we'll be very happy with the product. And uh, they have been absolutely fantastic to work with. So I'll uh, I'll start talking and I'll let the, the professional here uh, move on. Well, good, thank you. Um, right place, right time. That's the second time in a year that I've been in a place where uh, Travis has actually provided Kalia recertification. So he doesn't know it, but I was in the same place he was about three months ago when he presented. So um, that doesn't mean that gets awarded easily. That was not what that meant. So. <laughs> I thought it meant she might have been stalking him. That's <laughs> no, what I it's just <laughs> unique situation for us. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's a 98-page document up there, and I'm going to figure out how to present this very quickly with this. Um, but I will tell you that the way that we approached this process was we began to look at the facility on uh, Crane uh, Avenue, and basically... We're looking at a couple of different topics here. So uh, Chief Schinner mentioned that we that Harry Petoni and I uh, were the folks who came here, but we actually had a collection of engineers and architects come through the building and do the assessment portion. So that's the first portion here, this existing facility assessment. Um, there was a site, uh, kind of a quick site analysis done, which we'll briefly go through. The next step was to do a programming study to try to determine uh, what kinds of spaces your police department might need in the future. Um, and we tried to get them to break out of the thought process of where they currently are and to try to think about your growth as a municipality and to try to figure out what the appropriate staffing would be in the future as you grew. Um, that resulted in something that we call a conceptual test fit. We took the facility and tried to determine how much of the program, the architectural space, you could get into that building and how much of an addition you would need to do, assuming that the site accommodated all of that. So you'll see that. Um, and I guess I'm pleased to report at this point that as you work your way down the list from item two to three to four and ultimately to five, uh, the facility seemed to fit quite well on the site. So that's probably the first piece of information. Uh, we took that test fit, the site work that we thought we would do, what would have to do on that piece of property should you continue forth with that and develop the budget. That's probably the portion you'll like the least, uh, but I do have to present that. So we'll go through that quickly and then a schedule. So I'm going to pop through a couple of the sections, stopping at a page here and there. Um, what I'll do is I'll go through the section and then I'll stop and please feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, this document is in a draft form. We have one more back and forth with Jackie, of all folks, as you can imagine. She is quite organized and has everything organized from the folks in the department as to what we should probably look at to modify and hear, if anything. So the first portion of this is called the executive summary, and this is your um, quick brochure that you can wave anywhere that you need to be able to talk about the basics of this. So if you really want the executive uh, summary or the, the Cliff Notes version, this is the portion to, to take with you. I'm going to skip past that only because uh, I want to just get into a tiny bit of depth. And I know there are folks sitting behind me who don't want me to spend all night here, but I'll do this quickly. Um, this was really a description of the site and the building overview. It speaks quickly to the needs of law enforcement facilities, both in the community and in a facility, uh, the accessibility for the law enforcement folks, both within uh, the community as well as to the roadways that they need to be able to work through. And so that was talking about how the site had an accessibility capability, of course, uh, we come off of the highway, but you also have kind of a back egress point from that piece of property to Hawthorne Road via a couple of back road areas, too. Um, the area of the site had appropriate space for you to think about the parking that you need for the staff cruisers, as well as public parking. And it also had room, at least it appears at first shot, uh, for stormwater management that you would need on the site as well. 
Um, th it's been kind of a, a little bit of a point of humor to some extent, but we did show up uh, at the beginning of the process. The photograph on the left shows what was deemed the swimming pool or the small lake behind it. Um, it was only meant kind of as a, a bit of humor. Uh, the site ha is, is quite flat, as you folks probably know, and uh, stormwater management was not used in the day of the, the construction of the facility. So you would need to, of course, implement stormwater management uh, in any of today's work. So you can see the direction that the, the water flows on the site, and that just happens to be the spot at the very back parking lot area. From an architectural standpoint, the building was built in two phases. There's the, uh, the blue portion, which is the part that you can see from the highway. And then there was an addition of that yellow area at the back side of the site, um, two stories both. There is a wall that runs back and forth between the blue and the yellow that all of the structure bears on for both sides of the building. So that has some implications for later. Uh, the two stairwells, both kind of highlighted in red here, are uh, not ADA accessible stairwells, nor are they accessible stairwells. They're too narrow by today's code standards. So anything you did with those, you would uh, you would rebuild is what how I'd probably put it. Um, we had our structural engineers take a walk through the building as well. Uh, we thought that that would yield uh, some challenges. In the end, it did not. And I'll speak to that quickly as well. The areas in yellow were areas that the structural engineers thought would be reasonable areas to pop through the first floor or the second floor if necessary for the present or for, for any kind of circulation that you might want to enlarge through the building. And then this just speaks to the architectural uh, portions of the building. The exterior wall system is called a cavity wall structure. It's got a masonry wall, masonry um, uh, construction type, and then it has a small uh, air space in between, and then the brick on the exterior is is merely a facade portion to that. Um, but it's a pretty commonplace construction, and it provides the kind of construction that you need for a facility of this type as well. We go through window systems, door systems, interior, exterior, and all of those essentially are past what we call their useful life. Um, and so at that point, if you were to take those building, this building over, you would likely uh, go ahead and replace those as well. This just speaks to the toilet rooms not being ADA uh, and so on. And just a couple photographs if you have not taken a walk around the building to give you a sense of the various portions and the inside. The inside of the building um, is, is pretty pleasant to walk through. It's a, it's a nice office building. It's built as kind of a flexible office environment, so all of the walls can be taken out inside. And the way that we've approached this, at least, is to just clean the interior out and start over again for a police station, just so you know how, how we would think about this. The only uh, challenge to the way that the building is built from an architectural standpoint is the floor-to-floor -floor heights. It's a relatively shallow floor to floor height. I think I remember it being nine to 10 feet total from one floor to the next floor. We have been building buildings like the one that you're in today with about 15 feet from floor to floor, just to allow the heating, ventilating, air conditioning, and all the systems to run through the plenum. And this just gives you a sense of some of the architectural spaces. Number 21 is the stairwell. So if that creates any, um, any challenging feelings to you today, that's the reality of the stairwell. It's a bit tight. Uh, just some of the systems as well as you run around the building. Uh, the structural engineer, the real brief description of this, it is a steel frame construction. Uh, it does have columns through the center of the building that are supporting things with the exception of that bearing wall that I talked about between the two construction types. And it has open web bar joists that support both the first floor or pardon me, the second floor and the roof structure. Um, and then ultimately, what the structural engineer's analysis yielded was, although you have to build a police facility for the IBC essential facility requirements, which in essence add roof load and wind load to the building, with some basic lateral uh, resistance and lateral structural addition, this building can actually be uh, loaded appropriately for the requirements. So that was a big move for us and a big area of concern initially. I'll just say from a mechanical, electrical, and plumbing standpoint, um, essentially the existing building systems are all mostly at the kind of edge of their useful lifespan. 
um, plus the kinds of systems that you use for a public safety facility are somewhat different than an office structure or a typical office structure. So because of the redundancies we like to see in law enforcement and code often calls for, um, you would probably be re replacing the systems in the building, both the electrical and the HVAC. And this is just the analysis of that with the recommendations that go with that. From a site standpoint, the real simplistic answer is zoning allows you to do what you want to do. And I'll click through that section. And if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to stop at that. So I'm just going to stop for a second on existing facility um, and existing site. Are there any questions before I pop through some of the others? Yes, please. Uh, More for uh, thank you. Uh, so the roof. What do you mean by uh, you have to load it? Uh, I'm not, and, and is the roof, did it have to be replaced or just strengthened? Uh, that's a good question. So we were looking at it structurally. The existing roof product, the actual, it's a mixture of membrane and kind of a kind of a tar product uh, roof, the two different roof types, um, <clears throat> they're a pass their useful life. If you walk up there, you will track that roof with you across the entire roof area. Um, that was one of the things that happened as we went over it this summer. You walked and everything stuck to your shoes and you carried it from one part to the next. Is it an issue because it's a flat roof too? Uh, for drainage? We, I don't know bearings? that we're necessarily concerned about flat roof structures. No, because okay. you will taper the insulation to roof drains so you will okay. get positive flow. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. David, I have a quick question for you. You mentioned that um, one of your problems with the floor to floor height is currently nine feet, but you would like 15. How do you um, overcome that? Yeah, thank you. That's good. Um, in this case, what you would do is you would find common duct runs through the building and drop bulkheads around them, kind of like this bulkhead you see right here. And that would allow you to provide heating and ventilating through kind of a sidewall of that and let the rest of the ceiling go up a little bit like the coffered ceiling that you see above you. And that'll give you more ceiling height in the balance of the building. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Council, any other question right now? All right. Okay. Keep on going. So that gave us a sense of the existing building. Um, we sat in several sessions with a, a pretty good contingent of your police department to go through what we call uh, programming, and this is space programming. And we kind of do this in a building block format. We start with uh, the sizes of the spaces, the sizes of the office spaces, and we build the program out based upon your organization chart. We take the organization chart that you see yourself running your police department on, and we add staffing positions to allow for you to grow as your population grows. We figured out about a 10 year growth pattern here, not knowing how we're ever gonna catch up with whatever your, your increasing demographics are as time moves along. But we built it into the command structure, the operations division, the investigations division, administrative division, then the two portions, um, the holding processing and interview area, and then some of the comment spaces. And you'll see how that shakes out as we go through the building. Um, there are the essentially the square footages allocated once we'd gone through this process with each of the groups. We also allowed for an ancillary building at the rear of the site. Uh, so just to break down the square footages, the police building looks to be in the programming about 19,000 square feet. Once we put that into the building, we actually needed a little bit more square footage than that just because of the fact that we're dealing with an existing building. Typically, when we design a new facility around a program, you would find that we would get right around that 18,005. Uh, this, because we were fitting into the square that we had, it ends up being a little bit more than that. The ancillary building is meant to hold a lot of the equipment that goes along with the police department and also a vehicle processing bay for the evidence processing. So those things would go into that portion of the structure. And this just gives you a sense of how we broke it out space by space and person by person through the facility for each of the divisions. It just kind of gives you a little sense of how the kind of work that your folks went through to try to understand their future needs. So that turned into a program, and I'm gonna share with you how that kind of manifested into an option on the site. Um, this just speaks to kind of the philosophical thought behind a law enforcement complex uh, we call it front of house, back of house. There are all kinds of definitions for how that, how that works. The front of house are the things that 
I and the public go to, um, and that's as far within the facilities we can actually penetrate. Uh, then there are different functions that, that come around from the backside. One is detention, evidence processing, and all of those portions of the facility. The other is staff access back and forth into the building. And there was a fourth component that went into this structure as well. You'll see that there was an intent to try to provide some training space, much needed training space for police facilities, but also training space that could be shared potentially with other parts of your town and other government agencies. And then there's a, there is a fitness room built into this. It's into the program. You guys decide what you want to do as you go forth, but that required one additional pathway into the building. And so that's what you'll see as you get into that. So this is essentially talking about that philosophy of being able to provide front of house parking and then back of house circulation with a secondary egress point over to Hawthorne Road uh, from that, that part of the site. This is working quite well, thank you. <laughs> so this just gives you a sense of the actual property site, a property size, and because of the way the existing building is positioned in there, it gave us the opportunity to provide two pathways to the back of the site, and at the back side of the building are two gated areas, and those two gated areas keep the public out, and then the parking lot in the back allow the, uh, the police facility, uh, police cruisers, and so on to access that point, with the ability to go to the right-hand side through a couple of parking areas uh, eventually egressing out to Hawthorne Road. So it gives you pretty good access uh, to Crane Highway. It also provides good egress from the back. Um, the one note about the positioning of the building, it is fairly close to Crane Highway. We like to create a standoff for facilities like this. So we're recommending that some of that front area of the portion have either planted walls or uh, concrete barrier walls that could be planted concrete barriers or even those large concrete uh, planters that you've seen pretty much all throughout DC. And so those are uh, opportunities to try to create any, um, the ability to stop anything from penetrating the building from Crane Highway. And this just kind of gives you a site layout. You can see the number of parking spaces that can be, be provided both for public in the front, as well as for the police and law enforcement at the back of the facility. And this is, so, what we were trying to do was merely figure out if the program fit in the facility. That was the goal. You guys go and design this any way that you want as time goes on. But um, ultimately, the concept seems to work quite well. And I probably can't use a pointer on this, but I can tell you that there's a gray corridor that's running about two-thirds of the way up the drawing, back and forth. And then there's a gray corridor on the right-hand side that runs, oh, yes. There's a great corridor that runs on the right-hand side adjacent in, in between the two green zones there. Yep, that's the corner of the existing building and everything from there back would potentially be a one-story addition to the building. The challenge of police facilities is because of their function and because of how all of the pieces and parts work together, they often work best on one story, but that's not always possible. And so you try to figure out um, because they all do want to be adjacent, you try to figure out which is least wants to be adjacent to things. And so in this case, uh, what goes upstairs are the, um, the command function as well as the investigative division. And downstairs are operations and then all of the things that we have to do to satisfy some of those CALEA requirements, including your evidence processing, your chain of custody that goes with the evidence processing, all of your, any kind of detention, um, and so on. And so all of the area, the areas that are labeled in the orange here are those functions, and they get built into a structure that's hardened to accommodate that. And then the balance of that to the left of the orange area are basically operations. So that's the pathway in to the back, back of the facility that gives roll call, gives all of your locker spaces, gives the office spaces that go with all of the operations. In the front of the building are the uh, administrative functions that help me, the public person, with records and things like that that I might come to the facility for. And so that's essentially what this layout is providing. It also has at the very back uh, the orange portion at the top. Uh, that is a pull through Sally Port. And that really provides both the officers and any kind of detainee uh, probably the most safe and functional solution to detention. 
um, and holding, I should say holding in this case, because that's all it would be in a facility like this. The area on the right hand side in the green that I mentioned earlier is both a training space and a wellness space. And those two do have an access point available for the public should they want to use those or need to use those. And this is the second floor. That's the second floor of the existing facility. So essentially what you're seeing are office spaces and workstations for the investigative division as well as the command function. So it's a layout to prove that things fit. You have quite a bit of latitude to design this going forth, but it shows that what you have there with an addition to the building and with the surface area that you have on the site can be accommodated. I'll stop for a second. Questions? Thank you. Uh, again, Councilman Jenkins, Ward 4. Just a clarification, you say it fit. Is that with an addition or without an addition? It fit quite nicely with the addition, and it still seems to provide the room that you need for stormwater management in addition to that. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Councilman. Uh, thank you. Mr. Goldsmith. Uh, Matt Strollinger, Ward 2. Um, you noted that this um, concept was was kind of for the needs as we grow. Um, what I mean was this using the numbers that we we had from the pay point study, and and what stage are we with? And I know you said the layout is kind of however we want it, but what are you looking at specifically as far as our capacity with this kind of plan? So it administratively, you have a very cleanly organized structure. And so what was easy was to be able to go into the programming portion and to assign additional personnel to the different needs that you might have. So you'll see that there, there are positions in there for additional uh, investigative folks. Uh, you'll see that for the operations, we have growth allowed for in the operations area as well. So you'll see more officers, you'll see more in investigative detectives and so on. And you'll also see some additional administrative folks that fit into that. So if I were to look at the staffing increase that you're allowing for here, you're probably allowing for, and I'm, I'm doing this off the cuff, it's probably a 10 to 15% uh, growth in your total staff across the board. The heavier numbers though, being in investigative and operations. Okay, as it as we are currently um, situated as far as staff and needs, um, does this fit just without the addition, without the garage portion on the back lot? I mean, are, would we be able to get what we need with the the building as uh, structured currently? I I would love to say yes. The challenge that you have is once you get into the holding areas and the evidence processing areas, you do need additional height. You, de you need um, additional HVAC, additional power, and so on. And so that portion probably cannot be fit into the existing. It, it cannot be. I shouldn't have said probably. It cannot be fit into the existing portion. So you will need an addition to accommodate that. Understood. So the addition primarily is functional rather than, you know, a luxury item as far as more yes. space for people or items. So, so okay. Correct. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. And David, just to be clear, this will accommodate the 70 police officers and staff that we are um, looking at projecting uh, in the next few years. Uh, it will. Your team did a pretty nice job of projecting for the future, so I thought that was well done. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I'll just say, Mayor James, if I can, uh, you know, the concern we have, not a concern, but, you know, we want the uh, life of that structure to outlive its note, so to speak. So whatever uh, we anticipate, the whether it's a 20 year it's a 20 year build out that we need to make sure that we're not undersized. Uh, I've seen communities go in and build for today and you know, then the GIS coordinator ends up in a closet somewhere because they didn't properly size the facility to meet their future needs. It was their needs. So I think we've done a good job using the pay point study as stated uh, to sort of, uh, sort of envision what we anticipate looking like in the future and then providing a facility that will meet those needs. the 
All right. I, I feel like this next portion is going to be the most important, and I cannot wait. Sometimes it's the most depressing. <laughs> so we do this a lot where we go in and try to anticipate a budget for you so that you can build your budget around uh, whatever it is that we're trying to work towards and whatever it is we've studied for you. Um, the past couple of years, as you can imagine, have been the most difficult to estimate. Um, engineering News Record, which is one of our, our leaders in the, um, the kinds of professions that we're in, said that 2021, pardon me, 2021, yeah, had a 13% uh, increase or escalation in construction costs, and 2022 to date had had 10%. So for us, uh, where we usually anticipated a four to six percent escalation per year and could pretty regularly count on that, that changed quickly. So what we've done is we've taken several projects that are similar to yours that we've worked on. So they're renovation projects. They're not new construction. Um, they do have additions similar to the one that we just talked about at the back side. Yeah. And we took those numbers and tried to build those into this project with the kind of escalation that we've seen. So I'll click real quickly because the number there is, is not a pretty number, but I'll share with you how this how this came about. Start here. There was a uh, we call this CSI Construction Specification Institute divisions. Uh, those are all the materials that go into a construction project, and it's about the square footage cost for each of those within the divisions. And those break break out into a total cost for the addition work and for renovation work. Um, and I'll tell you, we actually did takeoffs for the renovations to get a real sense of what those costs were. We also had a site work and then the ancillary building uh, construction costs. These are truly estimates. There's nothing that's been designed. We're not doing true takeoffs, but we had enough information to be able to try to build you a budget out of this. Working backwards, the way that we build a budget is we do, this is a little, little fuzzy, I apologize for that. Uh, we start with the construction costs, and in this case, it's building construction, both new addition and renovation, and then that goes through the ancillary building and the site. And what that's yielding is somewhere around $13 million worth of construction. And that is a total gut, total redo, the addition on the back, and it also includes all the site work that will go along with this, as well as the ancillary building at the back. Projects don't stop there, though. You also have all of the design costs that go with that, that include all of the engineering, geotechnical, the land survey costs, inspection and testing, and all of those things. And then the miscellaneous costs, and we try to build in um, permitting costs. We try very hard to build in furniture, what is labeled here FF and E, furnishings, fixtures, and equipment. Yep, probably remember it from this building. Uh, and those costs, we worked from prior projects to understand what those costs might be. And then finally, technology equipment for the building, which is used you know, in law enforcement and in everything, has uh, kind of grown in terms of what is provided throughout this facility. Try to provide a total number there, and then in this case, giving you a project contingency. And again, we've used seven and a half percent because it's a renovation project, and that ended up in a project that could be in the $17 million category total. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 million is probably what you could expect for full construction. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 million is probably what you could count on for the whole project. What's not included there are acquisition costs for the property or lease costs for the property. So we tried to share all of that there as well. And the last thing that we did in addition to that was just providing you a little kind of construction milestone schedule. Um, and what this shares essentially, that's pretty small on screen. What this shares essentially are the phases of design, the, uh, the actual permitting time that it might take to get the project permitted, allowing you to potentially procure all of the work sometime in July of 2023, which would allow you to completely transition into the, into the facility uh, through September 2024. So it's probably a 14 month, 12 to 14 month total build out is what it would be to do that, plus the design and, and uh, permitting time. So we tried to give you a whole package here to understand what it might take to get you from A to C in the project. Um, I know the budget part is always the least 
uh, favorite part of everybody's day, but we have to try to lay out what we understand to be the cost in the next couple of years. David, before I open it up to the floor, I have um, two quick questions. You had uh, mentioned that you were um, uh, building out Gaithersburg, and they were they were not new construction; they were an existing building. What was their estimated, or what is their cost? I, I don't know if it's done yet, but what did that facility cost? So that facility also had council chambers in it because the old facility across the street has uh, pretty small council chambers, and this gave them the ability to use that space as well. Um, so that's in the cost, but again, this was, that was bid three years ago. So it's a very, very different construction. I just mentioned to you 23% increase when you looked over the last two years. Um, so the construction cost on that was somewhere in the neighborhood of $18 million. And then the total project cost was somewhere, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the $23 million range. And the other question is, this is the million dollar question. If we were to do a brand new construction and say we did have that lot, we had to acquire that lot. Um, but if we were just to do from bottom on up, not considering the land, what would that cost? That's a, so what we're finding now is renovations are costing a lot. Um, new construction in this project type is running 20 to 25% more than the value of what we've just shared with you. And then the challenge that you have is figuring out where to find a site that works the way that this site works. So those are your two challenges. Um, the reason that construction cost is only 20 to 25 percent more for new in general is because you're actually having to gut the facility and replace every system with redundant systems. And what's strange about it's not strange. What's unique about buildings like this is because of the sustainability and the survivability of the systems, you end up having more costs in mechanical, electrical and plumbing than almost the architectural. And so that tends to run the cost of these projects up significantly. Great. Um, council, questions? The uh, construction, you said, like the spring of 20. Uh, supply chain type things with materials and stuff. Do you have any feel for that? Is that realistic to say spring of 24? Um, whoops. We're in the same boat all of you are, yeah. and uh, we have great wishful thinking that the supply chains are catching up. Uh, we've had plenty of buildings open this year and in the last couple of months, and they have opened, but they've opened kind of limping along the pieces and parts missing, knowing that we have to add those later. Our hope is that 18 to 20 months from now, we're in a much better position from that standpoint. We'll see. All right, any other questions? Yes, so there's a seven and a half percent project contingency, and right now there's on top of that, there's a seven and a half percent design contingency. So on the construction portions of risk values, there's 15% built in. And it would be very nice for all of us if it came backwards from that low net. We all, we all always hope that. The weird thing about projects is you tend to actually go towards those. So we would hope that that carries the day. Construction on that, so I said, yes. yes. Sorry, side conversation over here. Um, go ahead. Thank you again, Dave Jenkins, Ward Four. Not to get ahead of ourselves, but I'm I'm curious. Um, does your firm or do you do project management for something like this in terms of coordinating the the renovation if we were to move that way, or or, or do you have to go to a different firm? Uh, a firm like ours is an architectural firm, and so we provide construction administration, which means that we are on site once every week or every two weeks. And I think what you're talking about is the day to day person who design does build. Design. Yeah, we don't do that portion of the work. Okay. So, Mr. Manuel, we've had this amazing presentation. Um, what are our next steps for council? Is it something that we uh, need to digest a little bit on the numbers, or do we um, uh, see if there's a consensus for the group to move forward on this? What What would be our next step? Yeah, we uh, 
it's really the will of the council. If the council wishes to think about this, discuss it further next uh, Tuesday at a work session slash meeting, uh, or if the council is ready to move forward, we're up against a an expiration and a study period which expires the 23rd of October. So we're within that. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we need to, to let the owner know if we are going to uh, continue with the lease provision or lease as it's written or whether we're going to pull out. So that's what we're up against. So uh, we, like I say, we have time. Uh, I guess next week our meeting will be the 18th, which is still prior to the 23rd. Uh, but if the council has a consensus tonight, we can we can take that as well. But I would leave that in the council's discretion. Yeah, that's a, a valid question. We had entertained uh, in discussions with USDA. They have a fund that they can uh, finance this through. Of course, there's typical bond markets that we could go out into. Uh, there are many ways, and sometimes we, I've worked on RFPs before during the design services that you actually task the uh, the winner of the RFP to find potential funding sources also. But I think ours are pretty standard in a, in a position like this. And also, you know, it'd be nice to get some bond bill money, maybe from the state of Maryland as well. Am I comfortable? <laughs> yes. People will always give you money, yes just finding the best rate for the town, the best position for the town. So, Councilwoman Bryant Ward, um, are you comfortable moving forward or do you want, okay. I am, I, I do not think that um, the supply chain is going to, I don't anticipate it getting better over the next, you know, three to four years. I, I think that we're gonna be in this very same situation. Um, to, you know, if we have the opportunity um, and we can be done sept by September 2024, I'm, I'm, that's exciting to me. And if we're comfortable that we will be able to identify the funding, that's, you know, I'm good with that. Councilman Jenkins. You asked my question, so thank, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm comfortable, I'm a little, well, let me take that back. I'm a little uneasy being under the gun, but I understand that part. But the question that Councilwoman Bryant Ward asked is, is if we can move forward, but have a little bit more detail if we can about potential funding sources between now and next Tuesday. Next week, yeah, I can attempt to bring that back. One of the questions I asked USDA because it is a okay. unique situation because we are leasing, uh, and they said as long as the lease extended past the useful life or the uh, bond itself, uh, the indebtedness, then they had no problem leasing us or providing us the funding. I mean, for me, that would give me a lot more comfort level, but thank you for the report, though. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Goldsmith. Okay. Councilman Challenger. I would like to know a little bit more about the funding situation, just given the amount. I, you know, I'm excited, as Councilwoman Brian Ward is, for a solid plan and a forward look at uh, what our needs are going to be in the future. Just, but just given the price tag, um, I'd like to know how we're going to approach that a little bit more. All right, and I am comfortable moving forward. I think the site accessibility, the visibility, and the potential to grow is there. It is um, something that we have been talking about for quite some time. Uh, so we have a majority to move forward, but we all are to we all uh, want to know more about the funding. Um, and I know there's an amazing person sitting in the audience that might be able to guide us a little bit more about bond initiatives and everything else about that. So uh, uh, I, I think this is a, an exciting time for the police department and for La Plata. Um, so uh, we're going to task you with just uh, informing us next week about the funding, but um, uh, the majority is move on forward. So whatever process needs to be done next. Mayor, may I? Absolutely. Well, I want to thank David for his hard work and thank Harry. I, you know, Travis came up from Richmond. These guys came down, I don't know how many times from the Lancaster area and spent time with us. And as we work through this, 
we we did our best mary you were with us a lot and 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 brent uh we tried to keep this away from fluff and very much to just the needs that we saw 10 years down the road and uh harry and david did an outstanding job guiding us through that process and we're excellent to work with so uh i, I just want to extend my appreciation to him and harry for their hard work for us and and putting this together and uh, I'll reach out to the chief at Gaithersburg tomorrow and thank him for uh, uh, putting us in contact with them. But uh, the horror stories I heard from some other chiefs and sheriffs, it was just the direct opposite for us here. And, you know, Chief, I have to say your, uh, the Jackie and, and your officers that participated, there was really no excess. They were not uh, greedy in trying to grab bigger offices or um, maybe one or two too many coffee places um, are there. We got rid of, sorry, Reggie. I mean, it, that we had to get that rid of that one, but they really stayed within, it, it was reasonable. It was not uh, gluttony at all. And, and I really appreciated being part of that, uh, viewing that from, from you all. Well, so. and the ability to have the fitness center for all employees, not just the police department employees. I, I think that's uh, gonna pay dividends for this whole uh, town as we move forward. Oh, and I'm sure our new uh, HR person will love that. It'll impact insurance and all of that. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. And uh, I know we'll look forward to hearing a, a final answer on um, financing, but uh, moving forward. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Could I just add a, just a, a comment, an observation that uh, thank you for, for the presentation, but also the fact that we were good, we were, that they used the pay point and information and study that we funded, the council funded to do that. And so it was Absolutely. great to see that being utilized for what it was intended to do. So I just wanted to underscore that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Next on the agenda, um, the Honorable Mac Middleton, come on down. Oh, it's, kind of, it's all yours. So before you start, I have to say I am so excited that um, the ribbon cutting is tomorrow for the Governor Nice Mac Thomas Middleton or Thomas Mac Middleton Bridge. What an exciting time for Charles County, an exciting time for you and your legacy and all that you have done for Charles County. And I know you don't seek the accolades, but I've got to give them. Um, so congratulations. Uh, I every time I go over there, I will think of you. So. <laughs> Well, my wife and I, thank you very much, Madam uh, Mayor. Uh, my wife and I go to the Northern Neck pretty much every weekend, and it's been fascinating to watch the construction. It's amazing the size of the project and the fact that it's come in on time, and as I understand, in budget too. So kudos to the governor and to the folks that were involved in that. Uh, um, you know, I've always said that, you know, my legacy, I was always hopeful that I could get a landfill or a sewer treatment plant <laughs> named after me. But, you know, to get Actually, to get a bridge, it's uh, very, very humbling, especially for my grandkids that travel with us to know that it's there. And I'll just share one little titty story with you is that uh, when the governor announced that we were going to do the naming back four years ago, believe it or not, uh, after we finished up, uh, we had a little get together with my family and uh, had some beer and some pizza. And uh, my then uh, nine year old grandson said to me, he says, Pop up, you don't seem to be all that excited about this bridge. And I said, Yeah, I am. I said, But you know, and he says, Well, let's put it this way, Pop up. And he asked his older brother, How many people are there in the state of Maryland? And Trevor says, I think there's at least six million. He says, there you go, Pop Pop. There's six million people in the state of Maryland. Not one of them living has got a bridge named after them. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. Well, thank you for being here and representing Cornerstone uh, Government Affairs. Uh, you have been doing great working with us. I really appreciate uh, your team. And I'm going to hand it over to you or, or to Brent for uh, an update. No, I'll just say... Uh... Thank you for being here. It's something we had talked about uh, coming and presenting to council, maybe quarterly, uh, bi-monthly, I think is also an option. And uh, I know it's very limited what we can offer tonight, but I just wanted to, you know, get you in front of the council and um, 
as introductions may be. I'm not sure that you need to be introduced. You're well known through the area and maybe you want to touch on the other team members sure. that also uh, participate on behalf of the town of La Plata. Absolutely. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, I'm Brent and uh, Mount Mayor, I tell you all the time, we have lots of clients. You're one of our very favorite, especially for me, <laughs> you know, coming from Charles County and uh, to be the lead person on uh, representing you in the state and before the legislature. Just Quickly, Jim, I know you and uh, Dave, I've worked with you pretty much all my life and know you very well. Uh, um, I, may I call you Matt? <laughs> Matt and uh, Evelyn, I'm looking forward to getting to know you better and to working with you. I think that collectively, I think we're doing some great things for the town of La Plata. I think collectively we can even do more things. So I'm looking to working with every one of you. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, uh, I went to Annapolis, spent 24 years in Annapolis, came from local government. And I used to say half jokingly that it ought to be a criteria for anybody that goes to the legislature that they serve their time in local government because people come from all walks of life. But the people that have uh, worked in local government, have represented people, have a better understanding that this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, you look at the federal government, you look at state government, with the money that they hand out, all those programs add somewhere, they land somewhere locally, and that's where local government uh, is so, so very important. And in a municipal government, you're the closest to the people. You know, you know, it's smaller, and uh, and so it's just an honor to serve you. Uh, printed, uh, uh, you get a, the bios out to everybody. I'll just really quickly go through and highlight them. Um, you know, first of all, with, we say in Cornerstone, when you get one of us, you get all of us. And uh, you can read the talent that uh, each of uh, the members bring. But uh, let me just go through, first of all, and just uh, uh, quickly introduce all of them. The firm was founded uh, about, uh, I think it was founded in 2014. It was started out, it wasn't founded, it was started the Annapolis office, Maryland office started out in 2014 with former uh, a senator who was my seatmate in, uh, in the Senate when I first went, P.J. Hogan. And uh, then there was John Bohannon, who was a member of the House of Delegates from St. Mary's County. Had he not lost his uh, election, he probably would have been the chair of appropriations today. And the third was uh, Delora uh, uh, Sanchez uh, uh, Ifacalci. Uh, three really incredible people. P.J. was regarded as one of the best budget people in Annapolis. And I keep telling people that if you want to be successful in Annapolis, first of all, you have to know where the money is, you know, have to know how to find it, and you have to have your credibility. You, you have to respect people because if you respect people, they will respect and listen to you. He was and is one of the most respected people there. John Bohannon leaves behind a legacy, um, served, chaired a, a very, very powerful committee. Um, just uh, re still regarded in Annapolis as key. Um, he has the ear of the Speaker of the House and many other members of the House of Delegates. And there's Delore. Delore comes from, she's got a strong healthcare background. She spent, uh, the only other career job that she has besides Cornerstone has been working at, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Bernie uh, 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 Marsick came from, he started out with the uh, with the Ehrlich administration, uh, working for him when he uh, Bob Ehrlich represented uh, um, Baltimore County in uh, the Congress, he then came to Annapolis with uh, with the uh, with the governor. Has lots and lots of com contacts. Great rapport with this administration. It's key if you need to know any person to contact in any of the agency. He's a go-to person. And then there's uh, 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 Ellen uh, Valentino. Ellen, uh, I. She worked for years, a lobbyist uh, in Annapolis, knew her very, very well. She's very, very aggressive, very, very hard work and juggles a whole lot of balls. She is just simply incredible. And then there's Shanetta Pascal. Shanetta worked in the O'Malley administration and she also works for us in the Cornerstone office in DC. Cornerstone's main office is in DC. Uh, we have about 104 employees there. and We have a presence in 13 states in, in the United States now. And uh, our reputation is is that, uh, you know, and, and we do enjoy in the short time that Cornerstone has been there, uh, a reputation for our hard work, for the expertise that we bring, and our dedications to our client. Uh, a lot of lobbying firms just sign one person to a client. As I said from the onset, when you get one of us, you get all of us. 
And uh, for each of our clients, we have a team lead, and then the three of us that work on the team. Um, and that's because if you're going to represent somebody, you have to be registered, go through the whole registration. Annapolis is a registered lobbyist. But every Monday, we start out our week with uh, uh, the Cornerstone team going through every single one of our clients. It's if there's a particular need, any client needs, we have so many, ex so much expertise and so many resources, we call on it. So. With that said, I'm just going to roughly go through some of the things that uh, we're working through. I'll just enumerate them, and then I'll go back and do a highlight of each where we are. And then if we finish with that, um, Madam Chair, Brent, and members of the council, we can open it up for more questions, if that works. That works. Thank you. Okay. First of all, the when we first were first engaged, the main priority that uh, was uh, uh, asking us is to work with the town in getting a water appropriation for the town of La Plata. So that, that's that been the priority uh, piece of work that we have been doing. Second, the sidewalks in uh, on uh, uh, Washington Avenue, trying after, I think, 40 years of history of this project to get it to bear fruit. Uh, the streetscape for Route 6 uh, to complement, you know, the town of La Plata, which is beautiful. And Route 6 is a main thoroughfare that goes through through the town of La Plata. And then to uh, uh, advocate for the ML uh, agenda, especially those ones that uh, pertain to the town of La Plata. Identify funding sources through the bond bill, it was mentioned earlier, or other uh, programs that may be available through the state agencies. Uh, added to that list as we, we continue to work was availability of uh, a surplus property on Box Elder Road. We've been very engaged in that project. Um, so those are the main things that uh, we have been working on in the last conversation that we have had. Uh, the next step that we're going to be doing is looking at the Coca-Cola plant. Some years ago, there was uh, a deal that was put on the table that didn't go any further. But as I listened to the prior discussion about the police station, the plate is growing. You know, people may like or dislike growth, but uh, people that own property have certain rights as long as it's in conformity with the town's plans and with the county's plans. So you're going to continue to grow. And uh, that is going to be a very, very valuable piece of property. You have not only your municipal headquarters here, but you also have county government head headquarters here. So land is going to be a premium. It's going to be a must in, in the years ahead. So now if I can just go back to the uh, give you an update on where we are with the projects. The water appropriation, the first meeting that we had, we met with um, uh, Ben Grumbles, Secretary for the Maryland Department of the Environment, to make the case that uh, the state needed to move on, given the town of the place some certainty as to where its water appropriation is going to be. And uh, I am surprised, I was really surprised when uh, this issue came up, because when I was the state senator, one of the meetings one of, that I had was with the town of La Plata, looking ahead 20 years out the growth that uh, was being planned for and the availability of water. And it was an issue then. And Dave Jenkins came to Annapolis and met with me. At that time, there was Chapman's Landing, which uh, Governor Glenn Denny decided he did not want that project to move forward. The land was purchased, but there were two production wells on that site that were drilled. They were actual production wells, test and production wells on that property. It was a hope that we could get the state to deed those over, not to the town, but over to the county that would then free up some capacity for the Lower Patapsco, which is the only aquifer that serves the town of La Plata. Um, anyway, uh, the secretary said no and hell no, he's not going to give up uh, water on, on a park for uh, uh, additional growth. He said, however, I will see if we can't get a million dollar appropriation so the county can then dig its own well in the lower uh, uh, Patuxent outside of uh, Chapman's Landing. Uh, every research that we've done said that that money was taken and the, and the well, a production well, was was dug over in the western section of the county. So the whole entire thing was that we need to have the water. The town of La Plata needs to know, have to have some certainty as to where the water is coming going to come from. At that time, there was an agreement that the town had put on the table that they thought was fair. Um, anyway, uh, uh, the... Uh, we asked uh, 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 the secretary if he could assist us. He said he would, and, and if he wanted us, we could. He could put some pressure on the county commissioners. But we thought, you know, we have to develop this rapport. We don't want to be, you know, secretary coming down and say you have to do this to try to work with the county to get that appropriation. Uh, if if 
uh, Bobby were here, he would tell you all of the discussions that they have had that have gone back and forth. The latest that we got was uh, done by the state. One of the people at uh, the Department of the Environment came up with what the town feels and what the state feels is a good arrangement that when the appropriation, current appropriation runs out, that then the town would buy its water from the county at the same rate that the rest of Charles County pays. In addition to that, they agreed that as a percentage of water that comes into the county from WSSC, which costs a lot more, that the that the town would pay its proportionate share of that additional water. So it, that the residents of the town of La Plata would be paying the same amount as the rest of the residents of the county. Um, that uh, the, the county commissioners had a work session on it and uh, they're not ready to move forward. We're still encouraged by uh, uh, President uh, Collins's comments that uh, staff to staff, we're going to continue to work, but uh, hopefully that the county will realize that, uh, you know, we're one county, <laughs> citizens of of St. Mar of, of Mary's, of uh, the town of La Plata, are citizens of Charles County too. And so we think that a fair appropriation would be is that our people in the town of La Plata pay the same rate as people outside. So we're still across enough thing is there. Sidewalk Washington Avenue, after many meetings with the, with not many, but a couple of meetings with the uh, county, the staff agreed that what they were due, this project, for those of you that may not be aware, has been going on for at least 40 years. I was president of the county commissioners in 1986, and the former board of commissioners had agreed to give the town $100,000 towards a right-of-way acquisition of there. And here we are today, still not finished. But if you go over that stretch of time, there have been some studies on segments of it, and none of us wanted to reinvent the wheel to go back and start over. So what the county agreed to do is that they would look at all the studies that have taken place, and they would look at where there were gaps that we could then put out for bid, get a consultant come in so that we could end up with some design for the sidewalks. Um, I, I asked, because I always like to know what the timeline is going to be, the staff person, well, what is the timeline? And she said, well, we can probably get back in about two weeks. That's been about two months, hasn't it? But um, but there's some unfortunate circumstances, and I'm, I'm going to use the, this is an excuse, a legitimate excuse. Uh, Mark Belton's uh, wife died of cancer, and uh, you know he's a county administrator. So hopefully we'll get that back on track so we can get moving. The reason why it's so important is that this money, this federal relief money that came down from the federal government, and we've given all of that, those different programs that are available, there are programs that fit this project. And those federal dollars aren't going to last forever. Everything that we've gotten from the state indicates is that once the federal government's appropriate, it's usually about a five-year tail that you get that you've got to spend it or else you don't get it. So it's important that we you know, identify what amounts of money can get be dedicated to that project as well as the beautification project for the streetscape for Route 6 so we can get and get those programs moving so we don't lose the opportunity to get that federal money so the taxpayers that pay their federal taxes won't have to pay double you know when it comes to uh, getting those projects to fruition. Street, streetscape for Route 6, uh, I must say that uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the insistence that uh, that the folks from the town itself has gotten and all the prodding that and connections that we at Cornerstone have. Um, you know, I, this administration, one of the big concerns that I have is that these projects that are on the, the farther we can get along the way, the more difficult and more unlikely it's going to be that a new administration, there's going to be a new administration comes in, will reverse those. So it's important that we move these forward as much as possible. So we made a call to the secretary and uh, within just a few days, he announced that uh, we're going to get over 11, close to $12 million, you know, for, this, for the streetscape for Route 6, which is an incredible amount of money. Uh, where we are right now, uh, his uh, secretary reports has assigned one of the staffers there. We're going to have a work session to go over the entire process. 
one of the things that they have indicated and that the town would like to have is that they would like to be part of this whole visioning. What does La Plata want La Plata to look like with streetscape that's going through Route 6? So it's their intention to involve the, uh, uh, the citizens of, uh, of uh, La Plata in that effort. Okay, to identify funding um, um, opportunities, um, I think uh, a good thing is that, um, you know, as we got into this whole entire thing with the session starting where we have this whirlwind of money, I'm honest to God, there's close to $6 billion of surplus money right now that the state has got. And this is a one-time opportunity compared to where we were prior uh, 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 the pandemic where we were looking at huge, huge budget deficits in the out years to have this money. We passed uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, um, Perwin report that's going to be billions of extra dollars going into public education. We've got enough money from the federal government to to fill all that funding through FY25. So now was the opportunity, opportune time. If there are specific projects that we need in the town of La Plata, let's go for them. And we've, we identified the Dorchester Community Center is one of those projects. Uh, we requested of the delegation to put a bond bill. It didn't meet uh, their first round. And thank God for conversations that we had with uh, Delegate Wilson. Uh, when you're chairman of a committee, uh, you are in a very, very powerful position, and through his efforts, we were able to get $500,000 for the community center. So ongoing, you know, I, I don't know, With we talked about building supplies and materials whatnot, how they've gone up the supply chain. I don't know what that's going to be. One of the things that we may be engaged in next year is to make sure that we have enough money to complete the construction of that project. So there may be some some need there as we move forward. Advocate for uh, MML's agenda. Uh, I mentioned the amount of money that we had. It was a good time for the counties and the municipalities to come together to advocate for the full restoration of the highway user funds that the state took away from the counties and the municipalities years ago when we were facing all the budget uh, deficits, structural deficits. Um, one of the concerns, and we had repeated uh, uh, meetings with the uh, appropriation chairs, one of the big concerns that they had are the out years. And so our, our, our request to them, if you can't make a commitment to a continuation of this, at least give an infusion of money you know, for these next couple of years while the uh, state has plenty of money. So there's some additional money that was able to, uh, we were able to get, uh, help, help municipalities and the counties to get. Um, the last project that came up was the Box Elder project. And uh, I will say, to I've, I've had a lot of experience with surplus property. I have never seen a process that takes from a request to where the state was ready to hand over the property in such a short time. Uh, I, I, their properties, when I was county commissioner, took years from the time the state declared them surplus. This was a little different route. Where we are right now, is that the state had moved ahead and said, yes, we, we're ready to turn it over to you, but we'd like to have a concurrence from the county government. And so we set up a meeting with uh, the commissioner president. He said, yes, let's get it onto the agenda. Unfortunately, when it came up for the agenda, he wasn't there. There were a lot of questions that are raised, so that is still on hold. But uh, and, and there's there's been some discussion about it, about the process that typically the state uses. Typically, the state, if there's a surplus piece of property, they ask all the state agencies, do any of you need it? If they don't need it, then they go down the line. And then the first local government is typically county government. And then if the county government doesn't want it, they offer it to municipal government. Well, this is, didn't fit this description. Those are projects that the state initiates the surplus property. We initiated the surplus property here. It wasn't the state saying, do you want this? This was the town of La Plata saying to the state Department of Health, there's a piece of property that's in the municipality. It's vacated now. It's running down. <laughs> you know, the grass is growing. We have a, one of our sewer pumps is there. We provide the water and sewer. We'd like to have that. Going back again to this natural growth that's going to occur, occur in the town of later, you're going to need a, available process, if not a, a properties, if not for right now, certainly somewhere out there in the future. And one of the things that uh, conceptually we talked about 
it, when we talk to the state agencies, there's a potential for a police station way down, substation way down down the road sometime. So anyway, the state was very, very quickly, we, they went through that process within the matter of months. Um, uh, Van Mitchell, and I apologize, I forgot to introduce Van <laughs> as one of the members of uh, the Cornerstone team who was a, a legislative member of the House of Delegates when I served in the Senate. He went on to become the Deputy Secretary, then the Secretary for the Department of Health for the state of Maryland. Uh, Van knows all the folks in, uh, in the Department of Health, and because of that, that property was just, uh, that whole process went through very, very, very quickly. So. So that's an update on where we are. I talked about some of the things that uh, I think that uh, uh, we have ahead. Uh, one thing that uh, I didn't mention is that I ran into, had dinner with Dutch Ruppersberger and then uh, 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 Jim Nada, who works for, for uh, uh, Congressman Hoyer, and he said, you know, there weren't many of these budget add-ons that came from Charles County this year. And so that is one of those things. I don't know if there's a change in Congress, if the Republicans take on it. They have not supported these budget markups, these add-ons. But uh, uh, if they do, certainly that is one of those things. If we move forward with some discussions about which we intend to do with uh, with Coca-Cola and purchase of that proper, that may be some avenue of federal money. So the last thing I'll have to say is that on the monies that might be available for the police station, uh, we Cornerstone can go through and contact the state agency if there is any available money there from the state or if they know of any federal money. So maybe we'll get back to you on that before you have your work session, Brent. So uh, again, finally, just thank you for the opportunity to uh, to represent you in Annapolis and um, local government and every once in a while we have some opportunities at the federal level that we're happy to represent you and uh, i look forward to the continued relationship especially our involvement with the council thank you very much um any questions from council madam mayor councilwoman brian ward for board three um mr milton how are you identifying the projects that you're working on on behalf of the town I, I'm. I can only speak for me. I wasn't aware of any of them other than the water water appropriations. Yeah, yeah just uh, when we were hired by um, uh, by the mayor and uh, and Brent, we sat down and identified. It, mostly, the the biggest thing was this whole entire appropriation because this has been gone on for years, trying to get this whole entire thing resolved. It seemed like it was going anywhere. So that was the highest priority to try to get that squared away so that La Plata would have some predictability. That was it. And then also funding for possible funding for the uh, for the town, the sidewalks, which has been an ongoing issue and the beautification. And then the other projects have sort of come along as we move forward, like the bonding for Dorchester, the box elder property. So. Yeah, they're part of the letter of engagement. So we initially, I think, engaged with Cornerstone uh, relative to the water appropriation. And then we amended that uh, letter to include uh, additional topics, which were listed within the letter of recommend or letter of engagement. And I believe it was voted on last year at the Maryland Municipal Fall Conference, which was a year ago. So and then, of course, the letter that came back before council uh, was that a month ago? I think also had the specific uh, areas that Cornerstone would represent the town uh, under. Yeah. Any other questions for council? Uh, Dave Jankis, Ward 4. Thank you, Senator Milton, for uh, briefing us. And I, um, I guess a couple of questions and then observation. Uh, so, I think it's important, obviously it's important that we have a presence, uh, the play has a presence and particularly one of my, I guess my uh, favorite thing is that we have a presence with MDOT and SHA, particularly for, for the streetscape and the sidewalks, because as you know, it's been kind of dormant for a long time. And so hopefully, you know, we'll have a presence. Is there any opportunity in the future because we've missed it this year I know the commissioners every August they put out a public information that they have a public hearing where folks want to come and, and present 
possible legislation to the commissioners and then they hold a hearing in September, October. So we've kind of missed that cycle for this year. Is that something that we should pursue on our own or should we do it through the commissioners well, you know, every some year? Of, some of the things where you have to have the legislature, your delegation involved, such as the bond bill. Okay. Certainly you ought to go through the, through the, uh, through the delegation. Okay. They have, they have their regular right. meeting. You know, I, I you know, I think one of the things that uh, that is is uh, presents a challenge is the the relationship between the town and the county. Um, you know, I, I I enjoyed the days that uh, when I was a commissioner working with Bill Ekman, and mm -hmm. you know, we represent the same people. A strong municipality is a stronger Charles County, and uh, and I go back to the that working relationship where. He came to us and requested that we get some money that they can do a visioning plan for the town of La Plata. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got him, I believe, $30,000. And every Saturday, mm -hmm. <laughs> you were engaged in that process mm -hmm. and brought the whole entire community. Mm -hmm. right. And fate had it that, uh, you know, the tornado came right. through and destroyed the town. And we had that vision plan finished right. and we were able to leverage all the federal dollars. And that's that's a, hopefully we can get to that where you have that good, strong relationship. So is there any opportunity in the future, uh, particularly as important as it is, because, because we're going to have a whole new administration and new secretaries, is it, is, it, is it some point where we have some kind of a quarterly meeting, whatever, with the delegation? I, I mean, I'm just trying to, to see if we can have a better presence there. That's yeah, I, 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 certainly a, a, a delicate uh, um, Gosh, I'm having my Patterson mm -hmm. um, is the chairman. Is of the chair? South, okay. She's chairman of the uh, Southern Maryland delegation, and uh, and then I don't. I'm. I think. I think Deborah is the chairman. Deborah is. Uh, she has been. I think she's chairman of the Charles Kelly delegation. Okay. And so yes, it it, it wouldn't hurt because we're going to rely on them for a whole lot of stuff to get on their agenda. Okay. You know, both the Charles County. I I know from time to time when I was the senator, we had the municipalities <laughs> that right. would come up and make a presentation to the full delegation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they conti or continue to do that or not, but that's something that certainly ought to be done. So, and we can certainly help you with that. Thank you. And then again, just it just uh, um, I think you talked about earlier in the town manager Brent talked about it earlier. You know, just to have you know, updates from your organization to us. So we yep. were kind of uh, up to speed on the issues because I know once the session starts, it gets really hectic. And of course, this year is going to be so much different with a new administration. Absolutely. So I would continue to see if we could do that on a yeah. pretty regular basis. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we've uh, agreed to do it on a, a bi-weekly basis. And, you know, um, any anything that I, I would su suggest is uh, the council, if you have specific asks or, or concerns or, or assistance that you may, if you would just uh, bring it to Brent's attention. And uh, certainly we will, you know, so that he's a conduit for, you know, the exchange between Cornerstone and council and the mayor. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Senator Middleton, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service to Southern Maryland. Um, I appreciate having somebody that obviously knows the players and you've been through it all and you know the process advocating our behalf. I had a couple questions for you. Um, one, you mentioned the importance of getting things done in this period of time, right? Before there's a, a switch over. Is there any reason to believe that we've gotten some traction on our top priority the water appropriations situation that we have with the county and the state getting involved before there's a new switch and we have somebody that's not familiar with the process saying why don't you guys go work it out i'm not getting involved right now right mm -hmm. well i personally have a good relationship with it well listen i'm not going to bet on who's going to win the election i think it's it may be fairly predictable in a democrat state so we 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 at Cornerstone have a very good, and I in particular have a really good work relationship with the new governor, and I really feel optimistic that we can probably get a lot more traction with him. You know, I, I, you know, just this, and and I would say this publicly: if we had a chance to meet with the county commissioners at a work session, there seems to be an attitude that the water under Charles County belongs to Charles County commissioners. <laughs> it doesn't; it belongs to the state. The, the waters of the state and. Uh, and that's where uh, I, I, the state has a re responsibility to appropriate the waters, the state waters, in a fair manner. 
And uh, I believe that the deal that was put on the table by the Department of the Environment that hasn't gotten anywhere is one that a new administration would get behind. I think some of the frustration, at least on behalf of, of us, is that the county has seemed to be very consistently getting their word out, so to speak, and, and we kind of got uh, surprised by a meeting earlier um, this year where um, uh, Director Stahl did a great job explaining the actual situation and context of what we were involved with, but is is there any um, work on behalf of Cornerstone of getting something set together, a more public um, forum, uh, so that we can at least get the word out as to what the real issue is here and, and try to bridge the gap of the misunderstanding because some of the, I mean, the talking points are, are way far off and I understand it's election year, but I mean, it, they're, yeah. they're just not based in yeah. the reality. Yeah, we are, we are developing a strategy, which, you know, I, I don't want, I'm going to make sure. public, but can certainly don't need to do that. Sure. Certainly work. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, what we keep getting is the politics of this just growth issue. And, you know, some politicians run from it as opposed to it's people have rights. It's our responsibility to plan for Charles County. You know, it has to be, you know, a, a source of pride that people want to move to Charles County and La Plata as opposed to move away from it. You know, it's a very, very desirable place. You know, people feel that the educational system here is good, that uh, it, there's safe communities and whatnot, and people want that and in, 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 in where they're going to make their next move. So, so, but you have to plan for it. And, uh, and I keep saying that every one of these projects, and there's a lot of concern about the amount of annexations that are occurring in the, in the town of La Plata. And, and some of the commissioners have a concern with that because ultimately they have the responsibility for the, for the schools and some of the police protection. So there's a legitimate concern there. But you, you address these by working together. Every annexation that is approved has got to be approved by the county commissioners. They've got to agree to it unless, you know, they don't. And then you annex it in. You have to leave it under its current. So, and then, you know, we have to look at the comprehensive plan. I mean, we took comprehensive planning very, very seriously. When I was a commissioner, we identified what we expected the future growth of Little Plata to be. That master plan that the county has envisions what the growth of uh, of La Plata is going to be. So as long as the town is moving within that boundary, the boundaries that have been set, there ought to be an understanding. There ought to be an understanding that you need to plan for things like police protection, your roads, and and you know your water. All of those things are important. You have a right, and and I think they have a responsibility to work with you on those issues. So, okay. Last question, I think. For and I didn't mean to be too. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's okay. I that, appreciate that. Too long on it. Um, last question is you, um, you identified that there is, there's a, a lot of funding available, um, and sometimes you don't know when that funding becomes available, and you've got to be ready to go. You essentially. do. Um, how important is it for us as a town to have, I don't want to say rainy day projects, but prioritized list of items that we want to get done such that when the funding becomes available, we're ready to submit. Yep. Yeah, I, I think you ought to do that. We're there for you <laughs> to help you with your projects. If you need state assistance for money, if you need state assistance for permitting, if you need state assistance for a meeting with your citizens, we're there to help you with that. So if we know what your priorities are, we listed these as priorities, and these are on our agenda. These are the things that we're working on. As things come up, you know, make sure if there's a new project, how does it fit in that priority list? And we'll work for you there. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Brent, do you have anything? No. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. you being here and, and continuing to work with you and your great uh, team. Absolutely. So if you don't mind, if I'd be excused. Uh, you are excused. Good luck tomorrow. Yes. And I know the weather's going to be beautiful. So uh, it's a, a, going to be a wonderful day. Well, there, it's going to be a very small gathering. They, the, the state's given me five people. So there's a little discussion in my household who's going to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so The wife's got to go. After that, it doesn't matter. Councilman Trollinger and Councilman uh, 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 Bryant, it's a pleasure meeting you. Looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Okay, take care.
All right, Mr. Stahl, Director Stahl, you're up. No, you can't have one of his tickets. He has 13 brothers and sisters. <laughs> Yeah, I, I saw that. That was that was a good one. On these next two projects here, I got some big project. You got any funding for? <laughs> yes, indeed. So, mm -hmm. We don't have it, but they would have some. That's right. Thank you so much. You. All right, you are up. Wastewater treatment plant ultraviolet light replacement. Um, Mayor and Council, the um, as you know, at the wastewater treatment plant, we have lots of systems that are designed to keep our effluent in a quality that is um, uh, not only within standard, but the absolute best we can be. One of the things we were experiencing as the summer waned, um, we have had several fecal coliform uh, bacteria samples come back positive in the effluent. That's usually a symptom of the UV system, which is the ultraviolet light system. And we use ultraviolet light in the effluent to kill any bacteria. Um, we have been addressing that with cleaning the bulbs um, as best we can. We have been pulling them out and trying to replace bulbs to increase the intensity. But what we found, we actually were very frustrated with it because even with cleaning the bulbs and with replacing bulbs, we were still seeing higher levels of fecal coliform. Um, the, the issue uh, became apparent that we needed to get Trojan, who was the manufacturer of our system, to come down and take a look at it. Trojan came in and indicated that they tested. And, and what we have, uh, for, for all of you who have been over there, we have a trough down at the bottom of the hill where the effluent flows through that trough. And we have two banks of 10 light banks each. There's 10 bulbs in each bank and they're on a rack and there's 10 of them across. And we actually narrow the channel down and the water flows through these 10 banks of lights. Uh, Trojan tested all of the banks and found that only four of the banks are actually still good and that there was damage to 16 out of the 20 and that the only thing they would recommend was to replace those 16 banks of lights. Um, it is a Trojan system. Um, it is proprietary, so it's not like we can go somewhere else to do this, but we need to replace those 16 banks of lights. I'm not looking to replace the entire system at this point. The system that we have is rated for up to 3 million gallons, which is the high flow of our wastewater treatment plant at this point. The system is designed and there are the light banks, the plugs in our system to be able to plug in six more in each one of the columns to be able to expand our system up to 5 million gallons per day. And our intention will be at some point to expand it as we need to do that once we get to expanding the system. This really is a maintenance item, but it's $85,000. And so we need to bring it to you all. Um, we're not asking to come in and replace the whole system. We just need to replace those 16 banks so that we're back up to par and that we're not worried about testing positive for fecal coliform in our effluent. So, I would come to you tonight. I recommend that we approve this and get these lights ordered because it is a 12 to 16 week lead time. And so we are waiting for those. We are constantly having to wipe down the bulbs. We're constantly doing things to, um, but the, the problem is in, in the um, actual wiring on the banks over time, they have degraded. And so we're not getting the light intensity that we should get out of them. So the idea here is we just need to replace them at this point. So I come to you and ask for approval of this so that we can move forward with the order. Any questions? Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, Director Stahl, were the, were the 16 of the 20 put in at the same time as the 20? Yes, ma'am. So why wouldn't we just replace the 20? Um, what happens is it's kind of like um, they looked at all 20 and they pulled all of them out and looked at the plug fixtures. And, excuse me, 
the 16 were actually degraded because of corrosion all in each one of the banks and that and they said that the four of them really had no corrosion had no reason to replace we may have to replace two of them later but it at this point they didn't feel it was necessary that, that they have specifically marked the four that were in very good shape and here again it's not something that they felt was a problem and we and we it is but I, I think that I would go with it. Listen, if I have to replace four more, um, you know, in the future, then we'll replace four more in the future. We're trying to do this on a cost, you know, we're, we're doing this on a maintenance basis and trying to do it as we see fit. And, you know, we're, we're working with Trojan, the manufacturer, and that was their recommendation in this situation. They certainly could have come back and say, you just need to replace all 20. But, but they the didn't. They came back they and said we needed to replace 16. Right, they did. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like putting three tires on a car. <laughs> you know? Right. So I, we're, we're going off. Now, we, are gonna, we, we do replace lights all the time. So we do replace, and they're just like a, a long fluorescent fixture. We do replace those fixtures on a regular basis. So the lights have been replaced. We're not just replacing the whole bank, which is the stainless steel frame that holds all of the fixtures and holds the plugs and that kind of thing. So. Okay. Okay. Councilman Jenkins. Thank you. Dave Jenkins, Ward. For, uh, so in your memo, you've indicated the source of funding mm -hmm. for the 85K. And yes. I think you said this is the actual manufacturer, which is the low price of, of the trolling <laughs> goods. We really don't have a choice. It is a Trojan system, so we just don't have any choice yeah, but to go somebody to Somebody else using Trojan, but they're a different company. We'd have to replace the entire system. Okay. On all of these things, it's somewhat proprietary. If you buy a, okay. a GM car, you have to replace with GM parts. So you're recommending the, the original for 85, whatever, 85, 12. That's correct. Okay. And to be honest, we will come back to you at a later point when we start expanding. Um, we will take out the baffle walls in the uh, effluent trough, and we can expand to 16 banks of lights across there, which will take us up to 5 million gallons. And as we continue to grow our wastewater treatment plant, which is the next item, we will come in and replace and add additional banks of lights necessary for each, each upgrade. So we, we will come back and have this discussion. But just like everything else, we do have ongoing maintenance with the plant. Most of the time, it's less than $20,000 at a time. It's just this one because of the nature. I didn't want to, I didn't feel that it was appropriate to break it up and say, well, we're going to buy four, four banks this week, four banks the next week, four banks the next week, and four. It, it's not fair to the council to do that. It, the bottom line is we come in and replace them. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Go ahead. I, I used the word that I caught on was maintenance. I'm wondering why we actually have to approve maintenance of them. I mean, it's just a big dollar figure. But what judgment can we make? It's either, yes, we let the system fail, or we fix the system. But why do you need to come to us to do that? $20,000 provision in the yeah, charter. It's still maintenance. We, we should. We've talked about raising that number because $20,000 today is a, not as much as it was probably 40 years ago when that provision was put in the town's charter. So it's something where I know uh, Ms. Harrington's working diligently on many code uh, revisions. And so it may be something that we lump in. And that can be under, um, in the future, will that be under a consent uh, item? Depending on the figure, but yes, as, as it currently stands, it would be something eligible for the consent agenda, the $20,000 revision. But if it's over, we still have to take it to council individually. Right. Okay. Um, is there a consensus to move this uh, forward to legislation? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We'll move that forward. And you've got yet another one. <laughs> um, as you know, we've been working on plans for the treatment plant expansion. Um, this, uh, what I bring before you tonight, as you all know, we worked with McCrone to design the upgrade uh, to our modules over there and it will add 250,000 gallons of capacity to each module. 
the um, what we did, we we have a full set of working drawings uh, for the upgrade. We put it out to public bid. We got back three bids. Um, the low bid was Nor Air Corporation, and of uh, three point eight oh five million dollars. And we had two additional bids, one from uh, W.M. Schlosser, who actually did the upgrade to our wastewater treatment plant in 2000, and also EMH Environmental. They were actually the high bid. The, um, the interesting thing was that in, in looking at it from the construction background that I have, the numbers were all very close. I was uh, amazed at how close they were. There was less than $200,000 in difference between the low bid and the high bid. So the assumption is they had all put a pretty sharp pencil to this and looked at the numbers pretty hard. Otherwise, you would have seen a much wider swing. Um, I did question a lot of other vendors who I thought were going to apply. And most of them were very concerned about the materials um, and trying, number one, to get delivery of the items, but also of the volatility in price, that they couldn't hold on to the volatility in price. Give you a bid today, and they had gotten a bid 30 days ago that you're going to hold them to, and they were very worried about the materials cost going up. Uh, so dramatically because of what you heard from um, the police consultant in the price of materials have just gone up dramatically. I do have to tell you that the number of 3.805 is considerably higher than where we had originally budgeted this several years ago. And I think you all know why the number's higher, but it is a challenge for us in a certain form. One is we have a fixed amount of money that we're committed with USDA for a lot of these upgrades, and that dollar figure isn't going to stretch as far as we originally thought. However, because the council took the proactive step to increase the major facilities fees that we did back in January, the amount of money that we're taking in, and you have to understand, for every 100 new homes that we're building in La Plata, we're taking in $1.6 million in major facility fee towards funding some of these projects. We still have about 1,000 EDUs left um, in the current capacity on the system. And when you think about that, we will take in $16 million prior to the need for this additional capacity. So there will be some a lot of additional funding coming in to be able to use for these projects as we move forward. And because of the proactive steps of this council, we have taken the steps necessary to be able to fund these into the future. So I don't think it's a problem with funding. I will tell you <clears throat> that MDE has given us the permit to construct they have not given us the permit to operate with the expansion. What they're forcing us to do is to take the risk, build the system, and then prove to them with a year's worth of data that the system is operational, and then they will look at giving us the capacity upgrade. So it's not as fair as I would have liked, but I do think it is the workable way to do this because we do have to start moving forward, because even when we finish construction, we will still have to provide them with one year's worth of data before they give us the capacity upgrade. You're saying they gave us the permission to construct the project, but not to operate it. So if you don't have permission to operate it, how are you gonna get the data? It is going. It is a contingency of allowing us to operate at our current capacity, but we have the we have to operate it in a testing format. So they've given given us the ability to operate when we finish construction. We will have it in a testing format, and what they've done is they forced us to operate it at the maximum flow through the plant. So they want to see 
because the new capacity will be rated at 625,000 gallons a minute. Currently, the mod can handle 375, excuse me, not per minute, 375,000 gallons per day is what the current rating is. When we finish this, we're asking them to increase the capacity to 625,000 gallons. They're going to force us to operate that one module. We are going to take in our splitter box up there where the flow comes out of the grit room and goes into the splitter box. We're going to have to cut a specific plate that we know the flow is going to flow through that plate at 625 and then raise all the plates on all the other ones so that they only get the overflow when we get to the 625 in the existing module. So most of the flow through you know, good periods of the day will all be going to mod one because they want to see the test numbers and they're going to make it hard on us. But once we do that and once we get mod one to pass, then they've agreed that we can get permits for two, three and four very quickly thereafter, and we will have the permit to construct and operate as soon as we uh, do that. So only mod one will have this provision. Yeah, and I think to build on what Bobby's saying is that, yes, it is maybe some risk, but at the same time, we thought it was the best solution because we could uh, uh, pull these mods to offline and upgrade them by pulling out the clarifier and the equalization section. The digester, gives, yeah, digester the and digester. The equalization. Yes. And that gives us 250,000 additional gallons of capacity within that. And that way we can adjust to the rate of development, which is so uncertain as opposed to going out there and spending what Bobby 20 million dollars to upgrade the plant and 35 was the quote yeah, we had uh, 15 years ago so there is you know a little bit of uncertainty involved but we're i think pretty confident that yeah. we will be able to met, meet the test the state has set for us this this is certainly the very safest means of upgrading the plant it doesn't put us in financial All right. Any other questions? It seemed like a good incremental step. And so me. we have identified funding sources. This yes. is the USDA, USDA. It's part yep. of the USDA package. All right. Uh, is, is that a pretty low consensus? rate again? 1.7. Okay. I believe so. Yeah. Is there a consensus to move forward? Seeing nods ahead. All yes. right. We will move yes. this forward to legislation. I will also say that the advantage of the USDA loan is that there's no prepayment penalty. So we can pay it as as Bobby uh, alluded to that as these major facility fees come through, there's no reason for us to you know continuously pay down the debt if we can pay it off. So we may be in a good position to do that. All right. Don't move because now this is like the moment you've been waiting for. It's legislation. We're going to move it down to legislation. Mr. Manuel. Yes, Madam Mayor, Town Council. Resolution 22-31, Wastewater Treatment Plant Ultraviolet and Light System. This is for your consideration of adoption. Uh, resolution concerning Wastewater Treatment Plant Ultraviolet Light System for the purpose of authorizing the town manager to enter into a contract purchase agreement for the purchase of replacement of 16 modules in the Ultraviolet Light System. Do I have a motion to accept resolution 22-31 as presented? Madam Mayor, I would uh, make a motion to accept resolution 22-31, ultraviolet light system wastewater treatment plant as presented. Do I have a second? Second. All right, uh, any discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Manuel? Yes, Madam Mayor, Town Council, Resolution 22-32, Wastewater Treatment Plant, Mod 1 Construction. This also is for consideration of adoption. A resolution concerning Wastewater Treatment Plant Modular Module 1 Upgrade Construction for the purpose of authorizing the town manager to enter into a contract agreement for upgrade construction of the Wastewater Treatment Plant Module 1 and all matters related thereto. Thank you very much. Do I have a motion to accept resolution 22-32 as presented? Madam Mayor, I make a motion to accept resolution 22-32, uh, wastewater treatment plant module one upgrade construction as presented. Thank you very much. Do I have a second? 
Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? What are you? Clarifying the number. Oh, okay, good. All right. Uh, motion carries. <clears throat> and we are going on to, so you are good. Thank you, Director Stahl. Uh, future work session topics. We have the annexation process and resolution 21-23 updates. Mr. Manuel? Um, I'd be remiss to say that uh, we skipped right over agenda item 3.5. Council agenda items request. It's buried in the. Oh, I am so sorry. So, so sorry. OK, moving back. I did. I did not see that. Um, all right. It's yours. I'll give it a rig. <laughs> Who's got something? Maybe that's why we skipped it. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, the further we move along with this, the, the more things that we we um, we get from from uh, from research we're we're still working in the consent agenda and we're still working in uh the um uh agenda approval at the beginning of the minutes um uh, we're we're trying to it's, it's one of those things where we're going to present the resolution to the council um for their approval and their review um, but it may also now we're noticing trigger some code changes and we want to make sure that we have all those ducks in a row before we get too further into this, but we're hoping to see this um, in the next week or so. And that's, you're talking about resolution? Uh, 21, 23, it'll be a new resolution number that will empower the standard procedures uh, as as the, the council goes about conducting their meetings, um, but it, will, it may affect code. Um, our code seems to be very, very strict about what's supposed to be in a meeting and what's not. And I'm not sure why it is strict. Um, and and thank you for that because we hopped way on back and um, Mr. Manuel put you on the spot for council agenda items request. So we covered oh, that one and then we're just see, hopping back there. Well, yeah. So yeah, so I won't have to do that later. Uh, the council agenda uh, request, uh, we want to give the uh, of the council more of an opportunity to contribute to what's on the agenda and uh, we wanted a unified uniform way so that uh, we could have all the questions answered that we need to get things on the agenda um, if you're not familiar with the agenda process real quick what happens is it has to be given to the town manager seven business days prior to the intended meeting um, that's not a lot of time but sometimes we don't get it that soon um, that notwithstanding, if if the council has a way of communicating with us and getting these things onto the agenda more easily, um, and and so that we we have all the T's and I's and things that we needed to move them onto the agenda, then we can make that that whole process a whole lot more pleasant for you and uh, feasible for us. Um, but if you have any questions, by all means ask. Thank you. I know that um, we have you, the town has modified uh, this council agenda um, request from the county and uh, at looking at it, I think it really kind of uh, does a nice layout of what council member, you know, as a council member, what, it, for example, what I would want to bring forward. So, um, my name, the date of the request, the topic, the purpose. I saw uh, Councilman Goldsmith uh, did one. I think the most important um, item on this is staff involvement, staff hours, and the financial impact, because we all have some really great ideas and how is it going to impact staff and finances. So I know that Councilman Goldsmith had one on HOA, and it looks like we have to engage um, the attorney on that, which do. yes, which is something that has been on the back burner forever in a year. Uh, but it is something that is very, very important. And um, uh, Mr. Manuel, is that on uh, the attorney's to do list? Has that been brought up to his yet? I think I met with him last week, and I do believe that was part of the if you don't can hold on for two seconds. I think I have moved the calendar. After just finishing the conference at a PMML, I kept hearing if you have any questions, ask us. 
maybe we should ask him first. Right. And see what they've got for history and background. Yeah, that's a great one. I know Jim Peck is always looking for a challenge, and there may be something in the 156 other municipalities that have come across this. Um, it just benefits the subdivision that it's in if they resurrect a HOA. They have more latitude to um, help their their neighbors in that. So it's not on the list I have, but I believe we did touch base on that. On what the process would be. So it's something that I will definitely uh, follow up on. So uh, Councilman Goldsmith made a great point. Do you think that first the request should go to MML if it hasn't? Uh, I know, as I said, Jim Peck is always there. Uh, great researcher. Should that be a, a request? And if so, who well, should make it? Yeah, I don't think it would hurt. I can make it uh, because there may be another community out there that has already gone through this and came up with a, a resolution, if you will, or a process to put in place to help assist these sort of defunct HOAs to get back on their feet. Uh, so yeah, I, I can definitely reach out and at least ask the question and maybe that'll provide us with a path move forward it might be something's going to require legislation at the annapolis level. annapolis yeah great thank you and thank you for bringing that forward um future work session topics <laughs> Madam Mayor, this... oh go ahead it's okay i'll take, have a, ask a question about this request form real quick absolutely thank you and thank you for doing this that it does provide a good form. Right. I, I, my only question my question would be and, I, and it's good to as you indicated to talk about any physical impacts but Sometimes uh, agenda request items could just be discussion. I mean, it, it's not necessarily. I mean, I'm really interested in seeing that we could put things on the agenda we could discuss that may or may not have any fiscal impact immediately. I mean, it could or maybe it requires some additional council or staff study. And I, so I guess this form can still be used if we want to have items for discussion. And, and topics. Of, absolutely. Okay. And the purpose, I think what um, we're looking for as well is what is the purpose, you know, for, sure. for a discussion? What's right. the bottom line? Right. What's the action item? Like, for instance, I understand one of the future items is going to be the annexation process. Right. That to me is a, a very good interest for discussion. Right. And so okay. it would be to educate. The, right. Uh, the purpose would be to educate the right. council on the Thank intersection you. process. And councilman, anything that's on paper is the opposite of etched in rock. If we find that there are problems <laughs> with the way this form works or things that you would like to see added, this this is very malleable. Councilman Challenger. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Madam Challenger, Ward 2. I'm a little bit confused as to this empowering the council. This seems more restrictive. I, maybe I'm just reading it differently um, when it comes down to the third page as far as department approval, town manager approval. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I mean, this is an agenda item for discussion. I mean, what's what is what are we looking for there? Again, um, we want to make sure that it hits all the places it needs to hit. Um, uh, I was uh, describing the uh, agenda process. If it gets to the town manager's office seven business days, that is the Monday before the, the following Tuesday, um, then it allows us to put it into a spreadsheet that we have put together to prioritize all the agenda items that come up. Um, some things are going to be more immediate than others. Um, some things are going to require a little more research than others. Um, what most departments know and most council members know is that then the Thursday by noon prior to the next meeting is when we need all the exhibits. Um, so that really only gives us about four days to look at all of this and make sure that we have everything we need to, to make it happen. So this is entering it into the system, not necessarily guaranteeing that it will be on the next agenda, if that makes any sense. Okay, so it's hypothetical. Someone wants to have an item on the agenda for pedestrian safety, right? Right. Well, there is and I, I mean, it's a, that is, but, but okay, so we, we perhaps, you know, during the month of October, right? Because we're looking out for pedestrian safety and it's a maybe it's a five to 10 minute uh, presentation by the chief or something else where we've requested that. I mean, what, what, 
who's approving that in a department? I mean, is it like approval may not be the best word, but basically it means that it would go to if it has to do with with traffic calming, it would probably involve planning commission or would involve the planning department or it could involve the police department. It could involve any number of different departments, depending on what information is being asked for and what 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 we're trying to achieve. So a, approval might be a strong word, but it does mean that that department has seen it and has had something to say about it. Um, if I can interject really quickly, perhaps if it says instead of approvals, if it says uh, something to indicate that this is on the staff level, that it's not council that's doing this. So when we get this form, we're not going over to the chief and say, please, sir, could you sign this or or to uh, uh, Mr. Manuel? I th and I think that's what you're getting at with yeah. the approvals. So if you're doing traffic calming, which is a fantastic um, uh, example, then now it is who's involved. So if they go to the chief and to Director Harrington, well, they're now uh, aware of it and they can say, yeah, I can sign off on it, but I can't get to it until December because we have A, B, and C going on if it's not a 911 that's going on. And the town man, or just like happened with... Um, Councilman Jenkins, where they had the, the streetscape, um, uh, complete streets, and unbeknownst to us, uh, Director Harrington already had that on the books. So I think this is kind of a checks and balance kind of way. It, it is. It is. It's a way to get the ball rolling. It's a way to start the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just pointing out that you are legislators and therefore are more than willing to start the ball rolling on legislation. Um, each of you sits on a committee and some of them provide legislation. You're more than welcome to sponsor that. Um, and this is just another tool to help the council um, get us to do what they need us to do. I think it's also trying to create a paper trail. I think sometimes we talk about things at a work sure. session and uh, so that it does, and then we can sort of program out our future meetings. You know, one thing I will say it's unique to La Plata is a lot of times uh, it takes months and most of the organizations I've worked for to get something on the agenda here. It's usually within a week or two. We try to facilitate that and I don't know as we can continue to grow if we're going to and our agendas continue to grow if we're going to be able to keep those timelines they may not be as realistic but I think the main thing is trying to make sure that uh, and also we use that to try to you know not so much recently because we've been sort of all over the place but some meetings in the past we try to almost have a theme if it's traffic say maybe traffic calming or maybe route six improvements so we sort of have a and also it's beneficial to the staff so that say maybe Chief doesn't have to be here the first or the second Tuesday of the month, even though he doesn't mind, or Bobby may not have to be the second. If we have sort of, you know, we can sort of organize these uh, subject, the subject matter in a way that uh, makes sense to, to all those involved. And detailed financial impact, how are we coming up with that? Uh, planning and zoning impact, I'm sorry. It says under purpose it has detailed financial impact. If if it's a it's a financial ask or or something to that effect, as as Councilman Jenkins pointed out, not all of them will be. But trying to imagine every contingency is, well, you know, it's impossible. But we're trying to. I imagine there'll be a lot of N slash A's in yeah. these columns, and you know, it could be something like, uh, you know. Councilman Goldsmith's talking of uh, defunct HOAs. Well, you know, one of the resolutions could be 15,000 per defunct F HOA for legal fees to get themselves reestablished. Will there be a direct financial impact to that? Whereas compared to uh, Councilman Jenkins, who uh, wants to hear an update on traffic calming and where we are, there's very limited impact on that other than our staff time, uh, which, you know, they're going to be here anyway. Got it. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, do we need to say anything about the future topic of annexation process? Or no, just the, the fact that we will be uh, something we're working with our attorney on. Uh, I think we have two that may be coming down the, the line in the near future. So we want to tighten up our process and bring back that, excuse me, bring that to council and uh, almost as a refresher to familiarize everyone. And then, you know, uh, so that the things that we're going to see and experience in these next processes are very identifiable and you'll be familiar with those processes. Thank you. 
All right, that brings us down to public comment. If anybody would like to um, speak, I ask that you state your name, whether you live within the incorporated town limit, uh, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Do I have anyone who would like to speak? Madam Mayor, there is no one present or apparently online who is here to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to make a motion for a closed session uh, pursuant to statutory authority uh, to close session state government article 3-305B1 I to discuss the appointment employment assignment promotion discipline demotion compensation removal resignation or performance evaluation of appointees employees or officials over whom it has jurisdiction uh, specifically uh, this subject is the town manager contract do I have a second second all right and we will do roll call councilman goldsmith all in favor please say aye sorry if you're not please say nay councilman goldsmith for going into closed session Aye. Uh, Councilman uh, Trollinger? Aye. Councilman Bryant Ward? Aye. Councilman Jenkins? Aye. Mayor James is aye. And I move to adjourn uh, this meeting. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, meeting adjourned.